Well, they're all new songs. That's always exciting. I mean, when you do a live album, it's nice, but it's stuff you've heard before because you, you played it all the time on tour, if nothing else. And generally, there's a high percentage of kind of old songs in there. When you get to the new album, it's always exciting because you've hardly ever heard them before. The people out there have probably never heard them before, except unless some like a single that's getting heavy play. So it's always exciting to sort of watch them. I mean, we've done a couple of shows where we've played the new things, and you see people trying to pick up the choruses, and by the third time they've heard it, they now know it and stuff. So it's exciting. <laughs> Having been on tour together, this is the great thing, that if you've been on tour, you do get a nice cohesion in the band. And then if you're lucky enough to be able to then make an album after that, you can use that. You can use the fact that we kind of know where we're going and if somebody speeds up a bit, we'll all go with him instead of like, oh, you know, what are you doing? Um, so that's good. That's really what we decided to do with the album, was to, to work it as a band album. I think it's real. Yeah. It's like... I, I, at this, develop this theory <laughs> <laughs> about music being too perfect now because it's possible to make perfect records. Mm. The technology enables you to do that, but this has little flaws and little and it's yeah. got character. You know, yeah, it's that's right. Six individuals playing music together. Well, we all played together. I mean, the, the, the what you what, you know what we played on the backing track was pretty much what. What came out the other end with that? Mm. But you know, everything was was sort of cosmetic after that, rather than integral. You know, all the integral stuff was done live. It's the kind of album just take it home and listen, and then listen again and listen again, and then your friends will. It'll. It's such a grower. It, I think it'll fulfil people's emptiness for music again. You know, instead of a lot of there are a lot of great sounds around, a lot of great rhythms, a lot of great chants, a lot of great rap but i'm talking about sort of gutsy good music i think people want it again people like the sounds of the 50s 60s and 70s and i think this has all of that and yet it's got something new as well i've certainly got a tinge of the 60s and the anger of the 90s uh the anger of the 90s is just being here and being in my case a parent with all this terrible stuff going on in the world you know if it's not ecology it's wars if it's not wars it's disease if it's not disease it's the politicians not giving us what we want uh, when after all they're only our elected representatives they're not gods you know we put them there so uh, yeah I think the album reflects a bit of that that, um, that it is time for a change <laughs> the album cover uh, because it was to be called off the ground once we had that title I kept getting this image in my head of just a sort of very plain album cover or a landscape or something and instead of seeing all the band I wanted the band to be in it because it's very much a band album rather than a sort of Paul McCartney solo album uh, instead of just having them all standing there I had this idea of them all vanishing off the top of the CD cover so you would just see their feet like oh they've just flown off and all we could capture as they went was just these feet. And I, I kept getting this image and thought it was quite a nice image. Slightly surreal and um, maybe memorable image. So then I thought, well, if everyone took their shoes off and we had bare feet, what would be quite funny is the fact that Blair is black, our drummer. And we'd, you'd have five pair of sort of white feet and then there'd be one little black pair of feet. And I thought that would be nice for anyone who's a sort of terrible racist you know that'll really be one in the eye for them it'd be like look you know sod you we've got a black guy in the group you know and I, I also thought it'd be quite a funny image um anyway but the joke was when we came to film it to, came, to, came to take the photo Clive Arrowsmith took the photo and uh, we all got up on our little scaffold it was how we did it and all the feet dangled down when we saw all the photos you can't tell who's which Blair is at all which is even better that's a nicer payoff he just he hasn't got the sort of black legs I thought he'd have, which is great, you know. It just shows what rubbish all that whole subject is, really. I, 
I went up into the attic of our house just to get away from everyone. And there's a nice little trap door. You can sort of go up the little ladder and, and then close it and no one can get at me then. So I, I know I've got a couple of hours to myself. So I did that, went up into the attic and I took with me a Martin 12 string guitar. Um, and just for a, a bit of fun, I put a capo on it. You know, that's the little bar that comes halfway up the string normally. And it changes the length of the guitar neck. So it normally makes it higher. Well, it always makes it higher, actually. Um, and it makes it sort of, on a 12 string, it makes it very jingly and very sort of Christmassy. And um, it always reminds me of a cathedral 12 strings. Jing, 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 little, little, nice little jingly sound. So that kind of led me into the feel of Hope of Deliverance. Hope of Deliverance. And then I just made up the words and then found myself getting this idea of hope, of deliverance. So then I added, from what? Well, from the darkness that surrounds us. So then that just came to mean whatever your darkness is. end of doing the album uh, Wix our keyboard player said to me he said you know there's one thing we've worked very naturally on the album he said there's one thing we haven't tried is this sort of computer thing and I said well no I'm not I don't really want to waste a lot of time on it he said yeah you might want to just spend a day on it just for a change just really just some do something a bit different now that we've kind of got most of the album so I said yeah it'd be fun actually so we gave the rest of the band the day off and me and Wix and the production team just came in to the control room mainly where you do all the computer stuff in there. And um, he said, well, you know, have some rough idea and we'll just work on it. So I thought of one of the songs that, that had been on my list but it hadn't got on the album. It was off the ground. It was different to the rest of the album in as much as we weren't a band all playing at the same time. And that was the main difference. And it was like drum loops and a bit more kind of techno, I suppose. So the minute we did that, I then said, uh, oh, OK, well, let me go in and put a little bit of heavy guitar on it then. So we sort of wound the amp up a bit and got a bit of grunchy guitar on. And then it really started to come up a couple of levels. We went, hey, this is good fun, isn't it? So we, so we got into it and really started enjoying it and um, put a bit of a, some machine bass on it. And that started to make it sound a bit even a bit more funky, a bit of percussion on it. And I sang on it. And it started to really come together as a track. So by the end of the day, We'd, we'd pretty much finished it. Yeah, so then it came around to thinking about what we'd do for the video. And um, with the title, like, Off the Ground, uh, I just had this thought, kind of obvious thought, that it'd be good to fly. But... What flying reminds me of is dreams that I used to have, particularly when I, as a kid. Um, I mean, you talk to a lot of people and they have dreams of flying over their school, kind of like, mm, I'll show you, you know, you hate me, but... You know, a lot of people have these insecurity dreams. Um, <clears throat> so I've, I had those when I was younger, you know, and you're flying over, you're going, yeah, hey, boo, you know. Um, so I like this idea of flying. But the way I'd always flown in my dreams more often except for those over the school ones was you kind of lying on the ground and you start to sort of vibrate and you get about a foot off the ground and you go wow yeah this is how you fly and then you start to sort of get into maneuvers and everything come on people let the world begin yeah i just started chugging on this little riff and, and the song come on people came out so i think it's i think of it as very 60s i think of it as a bit beatly too but whereas in the past i used to um, resist i mean in in the more recent past i used to try and resist any beatle influences thinking well you know i've done that bit of my career maybe i should now try and do something completely different but um then that means that you then deny some stuff that might have been very good. And of course, you know, I've got a, a reasonable claim to the Beatles style. So, you know, probably nobody out there is gonna bother if I, if I or George or Ringo do stuff in the Beatles style. 
So that's the way I left it. I thought, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to sort of just say, oh, I can't do this and try and rewrite it. So I'll just finish it up. So I finished it up and it, um, it became, I think, very sort of optimistic. one of the only songs on the album that felt like it could have a bit of orchestra. The rest felt very intimate and like the band. But this one felt like it needed to go a bit bigger. Come on, people, a bit more of an anthem. So I rang George Martin up and he was very sweet. He said, Paul, you know, he said, are you sure you want to use me? Because he's sort of almost trying to retire now, George. I said, George, come on, of course I want to use you, you know, it'd be brilliant. He did, he, he got up on the rostrum, was conducting it like a young man, and, you know, a teenager kind of thing. He, was, he put all his spirit into it. And it was lovely, halfway through the session, he just sort of leaned over and said, super song, Paul. And I mean, that is praise indeed, you know, from George. That's like, you. <laughs> In this case, I'd been looking through some of the magazines that, uh, was magazines like Animal Voice and Animal Agenda, which are pretty heavy magazines. They show some of the experimentation that goes on in the, for instance, in the interest of cosmetics. You have rabbits who are being injected stuff into their eyes and they just die with these terrible big runny eyes. And anyone who's ever been an animal lover, you just look at that and you think, what gives us the right? to do this to this poor animal. God, how does that animal feel? Like, talk about being unlucky. Talk about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Oops, sorry, rabbit, but you're not going to have a life. You know, you, you thought you were. And anyway, so you get angry about this stuff. I said, but it's not always easy to put into song. But um, I started writing a kind of rock and roll song um, after having seen this picture of a cat uh, with a machine that had been implanted in its head. They just took off the top of its skull and plugged in a machine to find some data, God knows what, you're going to find from inside a cat's head. started to try and write the song and I started with the line I saw a cat with a machine in his brain and then just made up bits about you know the, the bloke who fed him said he didn't feel any pain so I'd like to see him take out the machine stick it in his own brain you know this is basically how I feel you know if you need to experiment stick it in your own head you know that that you don't mind obviously yeah, we were And then the, the hook came about, so we're looking for changes. And it, it's one of those nice little three-word sequences that I haven't really heard before, and I feel like I should have heard a million times. We're looking for changes. It sort of sums it up in my mind. Looking for, the changes, uh, looking for changes in the way we treat our fellow creatures. This is a big boy's bickering, and so the game goes on and on. I'm 
a very firm believer that the environment needs saving and that most people you meet agree with that. So it's really up to the people in power to do the wishes of the people not in power. So I think organizations like Friends of the Earth are very important because they tell us, help educate us people as to what's going on and what might be done. Greenpeace, uh, I like a lot because they do that similar kind of work, slightly different field, uh, but it's ecologically uh, based. And then there's an organization <coughs> in America called uh, PETA, P-E-T-A, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, which is very good in condemning people like General Motors for uh, testing car safety things on animals. There was a girl who loved a biker. She used to follow him across America, but the biker didn't like her. You get a mixed feeling about uh, what it is that makes you go back out on the road. I think basically it's the audience. Um, because when you write a song, you do it on your own. And uh, similarly with recording, you just do it with a couple of friends. But there's no big reaction. It's just you. If you like it, then good, you go with it. But uh, there's nobody to really make the decision except yourself or the producer. But when you get out in front of an audience and they like it, it's very obvious. They just cheer and clap and smile and weep. It's a great feeling, you know, and this is one of the things about touring. When you see people out there actually sort of crying, you go, oh, God, you know. And it's a, it's a big choker, you know. That's one of the things I really love about it now that didn't used to happen with the Beatles. It was mainly, I mean, there was crying, but it was sort of hysterical and girls, and, and maybe they were crying for the same reason, but uh, now I can accept it more. I can accept the emotion that happens in concerts because I'm more uh, able to accept the emotion, you know having had kids, having gone through this and that, you know, I think you, you, once you've been through a few of those things, you are more able to get in touch with your emotions. <laughs> It's a big show, isn't it? I think it's huge. It's huge. Massive. Big screens and big, beautiful, big, beautiful big. people. Beautiful people. We got one or two tricks up our sleeve. You know, I, I, I don't like to use too many gimmicks because then the the set overpowers the music, and you find yourself just looking at the set all the time instead of the band. So we try and have some interesting spectacles, um, but so as it doesn't run away with the whole thing. So, um, just wait and see. I always hope for the same thing, you know, with, with people going to our show. Um, I remember what it was like to have to pay some of your hard-earned salary, and really, you do have to fork out if you go into a show. I paid uh, 24 shillings once to see Bill Haley when I was like about 12, and it was pocket money for weeks and weeks, you know, saved up. And, uh, but I was pleased with his show, so I didn't mind spending the money. And people would say, you're kidding! 20 it was a lot of money. This is before um, King Canute, uh, you know, a long time ago. And um, so, you know, I hope that people who come to the show don't feel they've wasted the money, feel that it was really worth it, they don't mind they don't feel like they've been fleeced. That's just why we try and give them a free book and try and do some of the songs they want to hear and put on a, a decent sized show, you know, just because it's so expensive these days. Um, I hope they'll go away with possibly a little bit better feeling about each other and possibly a little bit of hope for the future um, and with a, some vague feeling that that was a good band they just saw. Mm -hmm.